So often when we mention historical fashion, the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people living in the US or in the UK is British or American-centric fashion. But wearing and honoring historical fashion goes so much further beyond that, both in meaning but also geographically. That's why I'm so excited to interview Chong Sik today, who is a daily wearer of hanbok, which is traditional Korean dress, and also a maker of traditional Korean fashion as well. Could you please introduce yourself and just let everyone know about who you are? Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Chong Sik Yang. Um, Jeff as well, uh, my English name, um, and I am a traditional Korean maker, tailor, daily wearer of uh, traditional Korean clothing called Hanbok uh, here in New York City. I'm on Instagram, Yang Chansik, uh, you know, Korean, Asian, last names first, and on YouTube, reverse that, it is Chan Si Kian. It's such a pleasure to have you because I've been a fan of your work for quite a while now, so it's really exciting to have you here finally. <laughs> so firstly, could you maybe just explain to us like what Hanbok is and what are some of the historical origins of it? Because everyone might not be familiar with what it is. Well, hanbok is like a general term for Korean clothing. Korea is sometimes referred to as the Hermit Kingdom. Uh, we had like little to no Western contact until like 1600s, like some Dutch sailors came close and, you know, but very little contact. It wasn't until Western clothing was introduced that there needed to be a differentiation of terms. So like, it was just clothing. Right. It's just all oh, clothing. Um, so when Western clothing came in, that was, uh, I think it's Yongo. Oh, Westerner clothing. So hanbok is like a reactionary term, uh, much like kimono was where, you know, before having something to compare it to, there wasn't a term needed. It was just clothes. Hanbok, as we sort of understand it and know it, um, it has its origins back to the Three Kingdoms period. And that is 57 BCE to 668 AD. Those are sort of the visual origins of top and bottom called a jogori in the top or baji, which are the pants. And there are you know, two murals and drawings of examples of Koreans wearing this. Of course, there's clothing before, but you know, certifiable evidence back to before common era. And of course, you know, through any historical period of time, it's going to have its trends or influences from, I mean, mainly Korean history. We were very influenced by different dynasties in China. So like Ming Dynasty, you'll see a lot of similarities. You'll see a lot of that influence but it's had its own evolutionary track. Wow, and, and has it changed that much from 57 BCE? Like, is it still pretty much the same? Or is it more modernized now, the way that people perhaps wear it or construct it? What we know Hanbok now, like if you turn on a K-drama, every what you're seeing is primarily Joseon Dynasty, uh, 1392 through 1910. So that is the most, you know, recent where we have the most extants, where we have scrolls and paintings. 600 years will have its length difference, hems and fullness and colors and such, but you're mainly looking at the most recent of Hanbok lifestyle. Have you ever been surprised by a K-drama when they've like popped in a really old Hanbok and you're like, oh, wow, this is impressive. <laughs> I mean, there's a couple. I. I mean, I, I think universally, uh, we can all take a historical drama with a grain of salt, fashion sure. wise, like much respect to, of course, the creators, the designers, the makers, but uh, you know, that to varying degrees, the romanticized wash that exists over everything. But there have been a few where I'm like, I may look at it at first and be like, well, wow, that's wacky. But upon greater research and I'm like, oh, no, that's, that's legit. That's, that's, <laughs> there's a literal museum example of that. For the most part, it's like, I don't think no commoner would be wearing like viscose polyester. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, sure. <laughs> not in 1600. So, no. <laughs> you know, bits and bits, but the Humboldt's evolution, like what I'm wearing is very 
the most extravagant part of Joseon Dynasty. If you look at something per se, Hira Dynasty back in that like early period, that looks completely different. Like colors, textile, head headgear alone. It has had extreme transformations, but the basic concept of that jogori top, bachi bottom, those have been in existence for quite a while. Beyond different periods, are there different types of hanbok that are predominant? So I'm guessing there's probably like everyday wear, ceremonial, yeah. that kind of thing. Like there's, you know, within each dynasty period, there are, you know, royal level, there's government level, there's military, there's higher upper class, there's middle class, and then there's sort of like <laughs> the very low level. There's like a great differentiation between periods of what that would look like or you know government law saying these colors are <laughs> non-wearable so don't you love when governments make rules like those <laughs> oh it's great or it's like your skirt cannot hold that much fabric no 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 there are, <laughs> i'm gonna make a law about it so <laughs> asian fashion in general there may be some confusion of like hombok versus chinese clothing or japanese clothing I mean, there, like I mentioned, there has been a great exchange and there are sort of generalized characteristics of what belongs to each culture, but there are very similar instances. So I understand sometimes where they might not be exactly clear, but Korean clothing for the most part, traditionally, is very plain colored. You'll see a lot of white, like when you look at historical photography, I mean, beyond the royal family, of course. In mourning, Korean clothing was all white. As the eldest son, you wore white clothing, head to toe, your hat would be a white mangan, everything white, three years. And then depending on your closeness to the deceased individual, that would be shorter amounts of time. But when Westerners first came to Korea and like taking pictures and they we were commonly referred to as the white clad people. Mortality rates as they were historically in any country, death was everywhere. So you would be you would see so many people in mourning wear. So that is one sort of Joseon specific, uh, unique quality where people are like, did everyone? And it's like, no, this is mourning. And it would last for so long that most of the populace would be in white. Beyond that, there's different cuts of collars that are based through different Chinese states. There's different embroideries that signify your level as different government officials. Of course, colors, like universally anywhere. Some were extremely regulated, like no one could wear like gold or red. Different emblems, uh, such as the dragon, that is the royal family. The number of claws on said dragon signified your birth order as heir to the throne or the king himself. So many things were very much restricted in terms of everyday life of making one's clothing, choosing one's clothing. You know, it's very regimented. I think I love that about historical fashion too. And you see this a lot in Eastern fashion or like Asian fashion, especially. There's such deep symbolism. It, it shows you how much thought and care people put into their clothes, which is something that we've kind of lost touch with generally today, except maybe in like a few ceremonial instances. Yeah. Like I love the ability, I mean, you know, social freedom, you know, an entirely different conversation, but the ability to read a person completely from what they wear and how they present themselves, like every accessory, like different color beads is a different status. If you look at different historical periods, the width of my hat would indicate different things, how long my beads were. Going to a traditional, like in a traditional space, it is, you know, instantly, visible to everybody who you are, what your status is, what you do even. So I, I, I'm fascinated with, you know, cross the board, how that sort of is. Are there specific circumstances where hammock is worn 
often today in Korea? Because I'm guessing it's not very common that people just wear it like you do, like everyday attire. People in Korea, they're, you know, a few, lovely few, but for the most part, hanbok is, you know, weddings. It's maybe a funeral. It may be, you know, of course, traditional cultural rituals like festivals and such. Maybe you'll throw in a hanbok, but you're not walking around seeing this in Korea. Like, if you are, that person works for one of the historic sites. In recent years, there has been more of an interest, uh, very much like in Western fashion, towards our own cultural identity. So you'll see a good number now of modern hanbok designers that are uh, either making it into daily wear or you know, the, the survival is through weddings and such. Weddings, photo shoots with social media and like K-pop uh, especially. A Korean group may wear a very modernized version of traditional Korean fashion and that, you know, will spark the eye of the world at large. And then there's a resurgence of interest. It's, it's growing, but I... I am under no sort of assumption that there are a good number of Koreans going around in full Joseon outfitting. What, what does wearing hanbok mean to you? What, why, why did you get into it in the first place? So I am a Korean adoptee, a transracial Korean adoptee. Quick overview, that means I was born in Korea and I was adopted by a white family uh, in the United States. There were a lot of Korean babies adopted in like clusters of communities. So I had, the only other Asians I had around me were predominantly other Korean adoptees. So this was before, you know, not to age myself, but this is like the internet, not, not really a thing. Like what is Korean literature and historic information in a small town in America? There just is no, none of Korean culture at all. It wasn't until I broke free of the confines of the small life town, um, or small town life, sorry, moving to New York, finding Asian community or specifically Korean community, where it's, you know, we have a Korea town here, a couple yeah. Korea towns, and it's the Korean food having lovely, I consider them, you know, brothers and sisters, siblings, like literally took me by the hand, dragged me to restaurants and like this is how you eat this this is this this is this this is this this should be your favorite you eat this every day so it it's been a burgeoning sort of build up where of course we as people i think universally want to know more about our own cultures where we come from as we get older <laughs> to get more in touch uh with such uh but definitely as adoptees you know i only speak for myself but i know plenty of adoptees who have, you know, come to me or messaged me and told me, we've often been told we need permission or that we are not Korean purely because of adoption and, you know, separate conversation on that for-profit industry, being separated from your culture and in varying degrees of adoptee experience, but what that is and how that affects a person, um, but through that <laughs> led me to buy a hanbok, a vintage used hanbok off eBay. Oh, another instance of when people wear hanbok in modern times. When you're a baby, your 100 day uh, ceremony, your doll, uh, dressed up in hanbok and different ceremonies and such. So I knew there are instances where in a Korean life, I would have had hanbok that I decided to take upon myself, buy it. I found one blessedly in my size. That sparked it. Trying on, like, first slip on of Hanbok, and I, it's like, oh, no, this, this, this feels right. This feels very, very right. Paired along with not wanting to entertain the fast fashion industry and having some sewing experience, there wasn't an option in my head of uh, why why wouldn't I make humbok? If I'm gonna make my own clothing, like why not 
find the Korean method and Korean way of doing things. First instance of buying a used humbok definitely lit the spark of, I need more. I need to know more. I need to see who's making this, uh, see who wears this daily, just anything and everything. That's so magical though, like that you just kind of instantly felt that this is right for you, probably like a sense of peace, that that was just what you wanted to do. Oh yeah. Was it, was it gradual for you? Like, did you just suddenly start making it and wearing it or was it over a course of time? It was, you know, gradual. I mean, I'm, I've never been one to shy away from making a statement with fashion. Uh, so wearing like the outer, uh, called a durumagi, but like this beautiful teal silk coat with like a completely rest modern fast fashion wardrobe. Um, but like pair little tassels uh, on like my belt loops or something like that. So like gradually bit by bit, I made a piece for uh, a benefit gala I had to attend, but it, it wasn't like this was an overnight. As I know you know, it's you acquire piece by piece. And when I look back and I'm like, oh, wow, that was quick. But um, it has definitely been a bit to get to this fully idealized version of me. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause yeah, it really, it's really hard unless you just have like millions of dollars to make it happen overnight. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And blessed <laughs> to those. I mean, yeah. more power to you. More but power to you, but uh... <laughs> I enjoyed, you know, I can look back and go, oof, <laughs> wow, that was a mistake. I have a couple modernized humbug pieces and they're like my safety wear now of what i've held on to you find sort of your decade or your sort of period of that silhouette or feel and it may take a bit but you find sort of your stride and your historic fashion i feel grain of salt i don't use traditional fabrics at all like a few instances i might but i'm going down to the garment district here in new york and picking up whatever I think looks good. So I'm not obeying like a color law, but the garments, the silhouette, and the cuts are sort of like late 1800s for me, where I've like locked in on that. And I'm like, I'm good, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love too that you put your own spin on it because we really don't have to use like historically accurate fabrics, you know what I mean? I think it's that's sort of the beauty of it is I think it's still possible to honor the ancient traditions and, and modernize them in that way by making them in a way that's more accessible to us because you know that our ancestors would have done that if they could have. Oh yeah, like I am sure some like fabric loving ancestor of mine would have been like, if they had an opportunity, they totally would have. Yeah. If there wasn't government law restricting what kind of fabric you could use, I'm sure they would have loved to use this fabric too. What sort of fabrics were the, the go-to? Like, was it mostly silks? Because you see silk a lot with hamok, but was there more oh, yeah. like linen and hemp and cotton and things like that too? Oh, yeah. I mean, for the same reasons why we see a lot of fancy dress surviving today is because it was cared for. It wasn't worn. Like, if you wore it, it would have been recycled and shred to bits. But like commoner status it's like uh rami uh hemp there it wasn't until later in history that we got cotton and that was pushed upon the korean people to make more cotton garments but it's been like rough spun hemp and rami and then as you move up to the classes of course it's varying silks it's like thicker like brocades it's to the evolution of like a silk gauze I mm -hmm. think that was referred to as uh, window pane garments because of they were, they were sheer. Oh yeah, like, of course. Like our, the windows with like the paper on it. So like that evolution of the upper class pieces and royalty and such, of course, they have their own stratosphere of beautiful <laughs> textiles to use. There is variation, but there was very little variation comparatively to like when you look at European fashion history where it's like, oh my goodness, that is a completely different look within the last 50 years. Can I ask you what kind of underwear you wear? <laughs> sure, I mean, thank you for asking to ask the question. Jilsan 
historic undergarments. Um, so like on top, it's an under jogori, uh, named for the top. Uh, it's, you know, slimmer down. I'll make linen, moshi, uh, moshi rami, uh, under pieces, cotton in colder climates because cotton's my enemy. Um, <laughs> but for like undergarments, it's like, like little shorts almost. And there's like another piece and TMI, I mean, I guess it's in movies as well. It's almost like a loincloth sort of thing. Cool. And then like winter, you load up with like another layer of pants. So like when people ask like, how much are you wearing? And I'm like, well, I have seven layers on top and four layers on the bottom. <laughs> and I so wear funny. long garments. So like my general chest to knees, I, that's like, that's 11 layers of usually silk. <laughs> yeah, and silk can be surprisingly warm. Oh yeah, that's that holds being a hollow fiber, like that temperature retention. I'm like, I'm fine, like blizzards. I'm like, give me a silk brocade outfit and <laughs> I'm good to go. <laughs> also, you look like super stylish as well in the blizzard. Oh yeah, New Yorkers with like the black puffer jackets. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm sorry, you live a joyless life, but. <laughs> I'll continue to wear floral brocades in the middle of like a winter blizzard. This might ruffle some feathers, but um, how do you feel about white people wearing hanbok or Korean clothing in general, traditional clothing? I mean, I can appreciate an interest. I do, knowing the years before the internet and a globalization where there was no, people may not have even heard of Korea or like a Korean war. And I'm like, no, thanks. Thanks for that you know, the war that destroyed my country. No one will have the same answer or viewpoint. I, as a transracial Korean adoptee who grew up without Korean culture, and as someone who today still faces a good amount of discrimination, racism, harassment daily, it's hard for me to understand the availability of just generally a free for all. If you aren't of a Korean background, Western countries, we have a different experience as people who are discriminated against for anything visible outside the norm. Sharing such sort of personal cultural pieces that we ourselves face danger for practicing. Why is that? being sold off a by is it someone of that culture to begin with b like why are you wearing this i completely understand instances of appropriate wearing of different cultures uh like wedding environments if you are specifically asked to wear another culture's traditional cultural clothing to a wedding i fully get that if it's join in the Lunar New Year celebrations and wear festive Asian clothing. I get that you are in an Asian country or another country and they dis distinctly give you traditional clothing to wear. That's acceptable. In terms of if I were to see someone of non-Korean descent in this, I would be very confused. I try to encourage everyone being prideful of their own cultural identity, that I can appreciate other cultures and not feel the need to wear their cultural garments, traditional garments, historical garments and such. Totally taking into account the history of Orientalism and Asian culture and goods and the replication of such throughout history of the East and West. Like, I know if someone else wore this, A, you know, they may not necessarily experience hate, like physically in that moment, but why are you doing this? Like what your experience in these garments will not be the experience that so that I have in this garment. 
like I fully encourage, you know, the thirst for knowledge and understanding, like I will heavily research other cultures clothing. I want to know why and what and how and when and such and be, oh my goodness, like that textile or the way they use color. And I'm like, is there a way to use maybe that color combination that is not an appropriation of that distinct garment? Then that's sort of my way of how I will appreciate through other cultures. Like I don't feel a need to possessively own such. People want to be respectful and maybe wear pieces, but I do have to remind people to understand the hesitation from a lot of us. Where none of us want to be, you know, the cancel culture of like, oh, they're being racist and not so. And it's like, it's also a bit of every marginalized group's culture is put unfairly on different levels of objectification, where universally Asian culture from like Kung Fu movies in the 70s in the West, it's K dramas now, and it's just this. The mess of cultural things of Western perception, and it's 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 a very layered piece because Asians, Koreans, and Europe will have a different experience of the Korean experience in the United States or Canada versus the Korean experience of living with a Korean dominant culture and society in the peninsula. It's a challenge. There is no real, like, definitive yes or no. I can just, you know, be proud of your own culture if that is what you want to physically embody and wear. Be inspired. Learn about. Listen to people of that culture. Yeah. But I, it's, yeah, <laughs> it carries not only what it originally meant, but what it means currently as. A surviving, almost like political fashion. I think for a lot of marginalized groups, of wearing your traditional garment has recently, in these years, become more of a political statement. You're resisting, you know, something, but it's our traditional garments and silhouettes and accessories have turned into almost like. Pieces of like garment protest, at least in the Western cultures. I know yeah. there's resurgence in our like homelands and such, but in Western recent times, I I see a lot more of it. It's more like statement made when it is worn. I am grateful now for people like yourself and our lovely community that you know we will ask a question and. You know the good side of social media. Share our curiosity and our findings, and hopefully inspire others to take pride in our cultures and bring those to life. Bring those back to a living sort of state again. So, yeah, hundred percent. I'm so grateful to have you on this channel. Really, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you and and just have you share about. You know what the way you've chosen to embrace your culture and just Korean fashion in general. If not us, then who? Like, mm -hmm. I'm not waiting around for somebody else to take our culture from us or for it to disappear. Like, I'm going to relish in my culture and what I find so beautiful about it every single day. Like, why shouldn't we have pride? If you're of Korean ancestry and want to throw a tassel, a norige on your outfit or even on your purse, like, you don't need permission for that. Like, we don't need permission from anybody to have pride in our cultures and historical traditional garments or what have you. But like, our, cult our culture is our own and we don't need any permission for that to be expressed. On the total real historical probability, my ancestors were not this rich. Like, yeah. A, to see a current living descendant of them, A, just dressed in the finery that they recognize as being pretty top notch, but like to feel that sort of 
ancestral embrace, you know, that's, that's definitely, you know, you, you can't put prices on that. You can't, you know, buy that. Like that is pride and understanding yourself more. So. Absolutely. Oh, that's so sweet. A huge thank you to Chongshik for telling us about what it's like to wear hanbok every day. And also a massive thank you to all of you for watching this video and learning more about Korean fashion. If you'd like to learn about the life of an indigenous dressmaker, then I recommend that you watch this video next.